You're very welcome to the Keith Andrews Show, live on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter every Thursday from 12.30 and you can listen back on the, to the podcast over on offtheball.com. Nathan Murphy is joining me this week. Nate, thanks for making it. How me. are you? I'm very well. How are you? Great. How was yesterday? I missed a bit of a golf day I heard, didn't I? Did, we had a the, wonderful day in Lutchers Communication Town. wasn't really there, No, was the it? communication was. You just woke up in the morning, looked out, saw it was raining, and you've gone a little bit soft in your own age yeah. and, and missed out on a brilliant day's golf. Now, to counter that, we did a show, a uh, Masters preview show, which yeah. was brilliant as well. We would like Des Smith. I will download it. Jamie that. McGrain, uh, Roddy Carr. You should download it. I will, I will. Unfortunately, it did take place during the first half of the Liverpool game. So it was a bad one to miss. Second half was great. Second half was Second really half was where it all happened, wasn't it? It was different. To different. The first half, obviously. Different. Uh, but the golf day went well. Went very well, yeah. So I played terrible after, golf. Luttrell Sound always look after us. Played Peter Laurie. Played with Peter Laurie. With? With Peter Laurie. Yeah, with a pr- proper professional. Yeah. Who showed me up no end. It? it is, yeah. It's a different way of looking at the game. <laughs> it is, isn't it? A game I can never imagine playing. Uh, any good tips? Well, yeah. Stand close to the ball was the uh, tip he gave me, which I'm going to say ruined my game. <laughs> I like to stand well back and take a good big swing at it. I, we haven't played together. We've we've been involved in the same golf day, haven't we? Where was that? That was at Lutchell Sound, do you remember? No, uh, last year, yeah. yeah I didn't, didn't play with you. Yeah. I don't get out as often as you do, unfortunately. I haven't been I'm out retired a Retired professional. Mine was yesterday. I had fully intended going. Hectic schedule this week. Bit of a bit of a neck Aww. issue. The fact that I am going a little bit soft in my old age, I will You're not so bad agree with, with the that. broken foot, but Yeah, he broke his foot, didn't he, on Monday playing. That's charity football for you. Well, no good comes from it. I tell you what, he, he probably took that a lot better than me. I haven't heard anything what happened, but I'd imagine it was a bit of a naughty tackle. I, I would have lost a head. Someone nailed you? Yeah. In a charity game like that. A little bit of respect. Not, not even, just it's a charity game, lads, come on. Someone's obviously trying to lay down a little marker there, but Kev being the nicest fella going, he probably didn't say too Does much. Does it better. annoy you that Kevin Coban is seen as the nicest annoy me. footballer? No, well, why what? don't people say it about Keith Andrews? Because I wouldn't be the nicest. Oof. <laughs> well, maybe you should change your character a little bit. Uh, no, why I'm can't you be more like my, Kev? I'm happy with my people character. People love Kev. Yeah, I'm sure they you do. You could warm your way into the nation's heart. Just be a little bit, a little bit softer. I have got a soft side, but it's just not, it's not, not evident. show all the time. Okay. It's just quite well guarded. and right. I'm, I'm happy with how things are panning out. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of wow. panning out... What have we got today? We have got, obviously, Liverpool's magnificent performance last night against Manchester City. We're going to chat to Mark Ogden, who was at the game, ESPN's chief sports writer. We're going to chat about Ray Wilkins, unfortunately, he passed away this week. Um, and then Stephen Hunt is going to join us to talk about the Masters. Now, we don't want to give too much away about that, and I doubt he's watching anyway, but he is going to get battered off myself and Nathan. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, we shouldn't be sitting in this studio today. No, we, we should shouldn't. be in far more we should li- be in luxurious surroundings. Yes. But Stephen Hunt screwed us over. Glad to be here, but we were supposed to be doing the show from Augusta. Thanks to Stephen Hunt, that hasn't happened. But more of that later. Right, let's set the scene um, of last night's game. There's been a lot made of the the buses arriving at Anfield, the ferocity in terms of the, the fans and the atmosphere that they made it. Let's have a little look at this video. I actually think that was quite mild as well and, and, and compared to some of the photographs I've seen. Mm. The atmosphere, we've seen this a few years ago when Liverpool were going for the title. Um, the day of the Chelsea game. Yeah, and it was just ridiculous in terms of the atmosphere generated in the streets. Now, if I was a home player, I would be like a caged animal going to that stadium, wanting to go out. The atmosphere, one of the most iconic stadiums, fans in the world. But... I look at it, and again, I don't think we've seen the extent of... No, we don't see the, the bus get the front of the bus smashed, getting smashed up at the end. Which obviously isn't nice, um, but if I was away an away player, I'd relish that. I'd be thinking, again, get me off this bus. This is what it's all about. Playing in this type of atmosphere, this type of cauldron. Get, get me on that pitch. 
as soon as possible. But I just wonder whether it had a little bit of an influence. I, I, I well, there was video of Guardiola as he stepped off the bus having a bit of a pop at the Liverpool security staff, sarcastically saying, thanks a lot for protecting us there. Uh, obviously frustrated that the players were put in some sort of danger. And you obviously have to say when you're looking at that, a couple of idiots ruin it for everybody because now next time round there are probably going to be security measures in place that they won't allow that or the teams won't be able we to We see Vincent come there with, a, with a, a little quote last night. The bus incident had no effect on us. Not really. We have experience, experienced that before. Look, I don't think it would have affected him, but I think maybe certain players m might have affected them. But you know what's going to happen. Surely you talk about it in advance and you do use it. You think this is what it's all about. Yeah. This is why you want to be a professional footballer. Anfield, European night. We're going up against them. Looking out, seeing that, thinking we can take this down. We can leave these guys in tears at the end of the night. Embrace it. Did it have anything to do with it? Maybe it just left City a bit flat and gave Liverpool an extra couple Maybe. of percent right at the start. Yeah. What, what did you think team selection was? So I know you were busy doing the, the show last night. Yeah, I watched back the first half. Did you there. see the team? beforehand or did you get a chance to even see the them? Manchester City team yeah yeah I was very surprised that Sterling didn't start why I can't, I can't comprehend it the, the reason we believe uh, and Guardiola has said is that um, he wanted more control in midfield so basically he's played for central midfield at times mm. Fernandinho Gundogan the, uh, Silva and obviously Kevin De Bruyne but in terms of what that did for Liverpool first, you see the team sheet. There was two things for me, him starting instead of Sterling, but also Laporte starting at left back up against Mo Salah. Probably only going to be one winner there, realistically. They left themselves very vulnerable down that right-hand side. Kyle Walker looked very, very isolated at times mm. up against Mane and obviously Robertson going time and time again. I found the team selection really, really strange and I have no doubt that gave Liverpool a lift. Yeah, it was, especially with Sterling, who's been playing brilliant football, and you know you want to drag Liverpool out, you know Robertson is going to bomb forward down the left-hand side. How many times did we see him get to the edge of the city area mm. during that first half? He was going to do that regardless of whether Raheem Sterling played or not. So you know there's those gaps in behind that you can go and exploit. So that didn't seem to make any sense at all. And also you know Liverpool are going to give you chances, so why not go with an attacking side? Because this is the worst possible scenario for Manchester City. Not scoring. Away from home in Europe now, it's you need them. to get a goal because it does kill them. City may score the first goal at the Etihad and suddenly it gets nervy, but they're going to have to push and push and push. Against this Liverpool side is the one position you do not want to be in. But again, it was... You were at, you were at the game though in, in January, weren't you? 4-3. Yeah. Mm. This was on a, this again, I think, was a, was a step up for Liverpool well, in terms of how well they played and how clinical they were once they got into those areas. The first 45 minutes last night watching it back felt like the first 15 minutes of the second half mm. and they managed to sustain it for a longer period where it was just relentless. The noise, and Klopp is brilliant at this, taking advantage of what we saw outside, taking advantage of the emotion and somehow feeding it through to the players. You look at the first goal, Mo Salah's back in the edge, or Sadio Mane is back in the edge of his own area. He's the one who intercepts the pass, gives it to Alexander-Arnold, sets them free. Milner's tackle for the second goal. I it's probably not possible to sustain nah. that level for 90 minutes, but when they do... for 45. Do, I've never seen... And I've then never Salah coming off, I think, had a, a big change in terms of they had to tweak the game plan. Oxlade Chamberlain goes and pushes up alongside of that and in comes Wijnaldum. It's a different team dynamic. But go back, go back to um, James Milner. He gets an extraordinary amount of criticism Along does with, he? He does. Does he, he does. does he just not get enough credit? No, I think he gets criticised unnecessarily. Along with Jordan Henderson, last night they were phenomenal. Like There's been a lot made of Fernandinho being the ultimate holding midfielder mm. now in terms of gives you that steeliness in terms of defensive shield to the back four. Fullbacks go, he covers and throws areas, so he's got the mobility, he's got the steel. In possession, he's come on so much under Guardiola, I think. Last night, Henderson, Milner and Oxley chamber the three of them, were phenomenal. I thought they were phenomenal, and in particular, James Milner. Shows a little bit of depth that they have as well, because in the 4-3, it was... Uh, Oxley chamberlain Chan and Vinaldum yeah. with the midfield three, and actually... By and large, Liverpool's best performances this season against the better teams, when they've been really at it like they were last night, was with Emery Chan 
mm-hmm. driving them through the middle. So for Milner and Henderson to be able to step up is a huge boost looking over the next couple of months. It, I just think when Liverpool are at that level of intensity, like they were for the 10 minutes after halftime, and I've never been in a stadium where there was such noise, it felt as though Liverpool could score three or four in a, in, in a very short spell. And it felt like that in that first half last night, that they could go on and lead... 4 5 nil at half time. Actually, I think Salah going off worked in their favour. Because they because, had to play in a certain way. Well, they So suddenly it was a last gasp defensive job. Lovren's throwing his body on the line. Alexander Arnold. They stopped pushing for another goal. Yeah. They Suddenly it was, let's keep it at 3 nil. Let's defend properly. Because Liverpool's problem is, they're always looking for the next goal. And suddenly and you find you're 3 nil up and Lovren is isolated. Sané is getting in behind. Whereas by and large, they decided that's what that midfield three gives you. Mm. So we talk about the pressing that that Liverpool do. You know, pressing has become a, a, a bit of a a fashionable word in the last few years. Pressing isn't easy to master, and the way that they did it last night was so impressive. So well, the best in the world though at that they are was the best. Guardiola at yeah. Barcelona at that Barcelona team at its peak. They pick their moments think, to press. Yeah, but I think this level of pressing against a team that has dominated mm. the vast majority of the year makes it even more special. The way they did it and the level of aggression, it wasn't just winning the ball back, nicking it, intercept. It was ferocious tackles. And we're, and we're in an era now where you can't really tackle to that, that level that you could five, ten plus years ago. Though, that midfield three were flat across the pitch and they were doing, not just worried about one man, they were covering two, three players for Man City. The ball went to one player, they were on it. And it was just, it was, it was synchronised. It really was synchronised in terms of Milner goes, Oxide chamberlains behind. Every single player moved off the back of it. They just did not let Man City settle for a second. They re- it was relentless in the first half. I cannot tell you how impressed I was with it. When you think about 10, 15 years ago and you talk about pressing and midfielders going, have a think about someone like Robbie Savage in terms of going and pressing. Mm. Oh, he's very good. He's, he's brilliant. He sets the tempo. Headless chicken stuff. Yeah, but he's gone. Gone, out of the game. Good players. Pop, pop around you. See you later. But the fans, oh, Robbie Savage is brilliant. You're playing with Robbie Savage? And I should ask Kenny about this because he obviously did play with him. You must be thinking, seriously, somebody get the reins on that fella because he's killing us behind. So actually, there's a lot of discipline to what Liverpool are doing last night because one of the criticisms of Klopp has always been that actually they are sort of headless chickens at times, that they do just tear around. So the front, maybe the front three press well, but actually in midfield sometimes they just fly up the pitch to leave the defence isolated. Maybe it is... Having Milner, an experienced player, Henderson, who is a little bit more limited, that experience, but still have the the physical attributes to affect it in the way that Klopp mm. Klopp wants to. I mean, last night was a, a unbelievable success story for Klopp in any number of ways. From the way he's managed to develop Alexander Arnold and seems to have learned his lessons in the space of a couple of weeks, the way they targeted him again and again, and he didn't falter. Yeah, he was impressive. The way Andy Robertson has come on, having not got in the team and waiting and waiting and seeing him on the training ground, giving him his chance, but also James Milner was possibly the best left back in the Premier League for five, six months last season, decides, no, I'm done with you there. Mm. I want you as a central midfielder. Barely saw any game time pre-Christmas and suddenly now looks fresh again. Mm. The one thing is, is this tie over? If City do score first, like... I I, I don't think it's over. I genuinely don't think it's over. But there's not going to be an atmosphere like there was last night. Like City can... They just don't have it. And that's what made last night so unusual. It's very rare at any football stadium. And there's probably a greater conversation as to what type of crowd was there for Liverpool last night in that a lot of the tourists who would have their season tickets generally don't go to the midweek games because they're travelling from abroad. So you get more of the real hardcore support in there who will probably lose a rag or aren't maybe just taking as many photos and getting their pictures outside and buying all the merchandise and that. They're there for the game. You'd have to think, though, everything we've seen suggests Liverpool can score away yeah, from home. Yeah, I agree. Have you ever been in a situation? We'll, have to, we'll, come, back, we'll come back to that because we've got Mark Ogden waiting on the line, senior football writer for ESPN. Mark, thanks for joining us. You were at the game last night. Can you just try and build, build a picture of was the atmosphere as good as it looked on the TV? <laughs> it was. I mean, you know, I'm coming from... Manchester, you know, I've grown up watching United and, and less so City, and uh, 
one thing you always hear about the Anfield atmosphere is that it's a bit of a myth, a bit of a cliche. Um, I've been there a few times and it does make a difference. I think the point I was trying to make to, to City fans who were kind of sceptical about it was that it's not one that's going to intimidate the City players or make a difference to them. It, it, it's what it does to the home team. It, it kind of it energises Liverpool beyond anything you've ever seen. And it's, it, it's the extra... It's almost like they've given them an injection of belief and energy and that ability to win every second ball. And that's, that's the difference it made. It was just so noisy. And the, the crowd was a 12th man and the, the City fans I was speaking to were kind of mocking it all a little bit and playing it down, as if to say. But I think the reason for that is that there isn't an atmosphere at City so that the City players don't know what it's like to play in an atmosphere where 95% of the fans are behind them. The Etihad doesn't have an atmosphere. It's one of the worst stadiums in the country for, for that. So... Uh, There'll be no, uh, there'll be no Etihad glory night on Tuesday, I don't think. All right, what was the feeling um, in and around the stadium in the press room when you received the team news? No major surprises, I would suggest, with, with Liverpool's team selection, but certainly from Man City's point of view, we've already been chatting Laporte starting at left back, but also the, probably the biggest call, Gundogan playing instead of Raheem Sterling. Yeah, I mean, a lot of surprise. I mean, I've done a piece, I did a piece after the game last night about Pep's vanity, just basically every time. He gets the, 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 the kind of business end of the Champions League. He takes a chance and he gets found out. And there's been a lot of occasions where his teams have been absolutely battered in the latter stages. And I think I don't think he pays enough respect to the opposition at times. I think playing Laporte at left back was a crazy mistake. He tried him out against Everton at the weekend. Now Everton at Goodison Park this season is no real kind of tester for a game at Anfield. He actually played Laporte at position. He left Carl Walker to patrol the whole right side of the pitch on his own, as well as keeping that close to Sadio Mane. Gundogan in midfield alongside Fernandinho went too defensive. They look like two old men. Not playing Sterling. Now, I, I can understand the Sterling selection because he never does well at Anfield. He goes there and he, I think he's intimidated by the atmosphere and the Liverpool fans get at him and they give him a lot of stick and he doesn't perform there. So I can understand that but, you know, sometimes these are the occasions where the big players turn up and I think Sterling had to be trusted last night because Gabriel Jesus, for me, didn't do it and he's not done it for a while now for City. So, this is a strange, strange night all round, and I think also he's let down by the fact that a lot of his big players didn't perform. You know, we've spoken all season about Kevin De Bruyne; they didn't do it last night. We all raved about David Silva playing fantastic at Stoke recently, but the Stoke on a Monday night is Liverpool in the Champions League quarter final, and he didn't perform either. So Pep was let down by his players, but he let them down in the first place by picking such a team, balanced team. Surely that midfield, and that we have eulogised all season long about. Kevin De Bruyne probably in particular we've been used to seeing David Silva perform at a, at a very high standard surely they would have been expecting that type of intensity from the Liverpool midfield but I, I was even a little bit taken aback just by their sheer ferocity and tempo they literally just could not get going especially in the first half could they in, in, in that central midfield which a lot of the joy comes from for Manchester City Well there were no excuses for City because they played there in January and had the same experience when they lost 4-3 they knew exactly what was um what was coming and they didn't prepare for it and I don't know I mean you may know better than me Keith you've, you've played long seasons and I, I think City and Guardiola have played the same team time and time again at, to such a high intensity and I, and I always felt that at some point of the season they might just find it in the legs a little bit and find it a bit and I thought De Bruyne last night and Silva looks a bit leggy I thought they, they looked like they've kind of they've put their best efforts in this season and we're hitting look the 16 points clear in the Premier League so it's paid off but I did think, think last night that they didn't have that extra energy to match Liverpool when they needed it. And I think Pep maybe has played them too much too often. Is there a problem as well for Guardiola that they've struck such fear into so many teams in the Premier League that now when they go out, teams sit right back, as they do quite often against Liverpool, that simply De Bruyne, Silva, Fernandinho, they've got too used to having as much time as they want on the ball to pick their passes, to completely dominate games, that it was almost alien to them last night having to deal with Sadio Mane dropping deep, biting at their heels, the Liverpool midfield three getting at them, that it was just a, a totally different pace of game than they've become used to. Absolutely. I think that was a that was a massive point last night. And I think too many teams, even the big teams, United, Chelsea, Arsenal, have, gone, have played City and almost been beaten in the tunnel. They've, they've not given them a game. They've not gone at them. And I think, I think they're not used to being attacked. And I felt that when they got to this stage of the Champions League or maybe the semi-finals, that they'd play Barca, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich and Liverpool, who would go at them with three forwards and pose questions and get at them and I, I think too often this season they've just been given they've been given an easy ride in the Premier League and in the Champions League to this stage and I think it did come as a shot to the system last night 
listen, Manchester City and the talent they have and the way Liverpool have capitulated at times, who knows, maybe they can come back. But if they don't, and this is the end of the road for them in the Champions League this season, is it potentially a defining night for what they do over the summer that suddenly they're having to recalibrate everything in terms of who they go and sign, the type of players they want to sign to bring them to another level? Well, potentially, but Pep spent £450 million in less than two years, so where do you start? Where do you go? And he, and he spent that money in, in all areas of the team, you know. You can probably see why they wanted Alexis Sanchez after last night, because, you know, when Aguero's not there, I don't think Gabriel Jesus is... I, he's got a lot of hype around him, but I'm not sure he delivers when it matters often enough. And I think he does need another striker. I think in midfield, you know, Fernandinho does a great job, but maybe in his early 30s. And I don't know, I, I think that how much money can he spend? I mean, he's built a new back four, so at some point he's just going to have to let it settle, settle down and, and see what it takes. And But yeah, of course, to spend big money, that's what they do. Mark, Saturday, obviously, they face Manchester United. What what are you expecting from that? What's the approach from Guardiola? You've already mentioned about possible fatigue setting in, and I'm, I'm certainly with you with that in terms of the, the minutes that they've accumulated, especially in that central midfield area. De Bruyne, in particular, I thought, really didn't affect it to the level we've come to expect. Does he rest players against United, or do you expect him to to go strong and get back on track as quick as possible? Well, there's, there's a real kind of debate going on among City fans about this, because I think Pep's made it clear that he's going he's gonna to rest players. The, the team he picks on, on Saturday will be defined by what he has to do on, on Tuesday, and I, I agree with that. I think they're going to win the league, so whether they win it on Saturday against United or not, they're going to win it. The, the, the big thing, the priority is the Liverpool game, but City fans, they want to win the title by beating United, and I think their view is that Pep should play his strongest team, get that defeat against Liverpool at the system and beat United, but it was Wednesday night, it's a Saturday game, they play Tuesday. I, I think it'd be crazy for Guardiola to play his best team. I think he I think he should, every, every member of his starting eleven on Tuesday should be on the bench or rest of the weekend, because, you know, if they beat United by playing a strong team at the weekend, but then lose to Liverpool, what what was it achieved? You know, they've won the league. They're going to win it anyway. So rest rest your players, give your kids a chance, give Phil Foden a chance. It's a derby game. Let, let's see what they've got beyond, beyond the surface. And I think it's a typical one for Mourinho because what does Mourinho do? Does he does he plan to play against a strong team? Or does he plan for City's second string? I just think Guardiola has to rest his best players and give them a breather. What are you anticipating then next Tuesday? Are you expecting Sterling back in the team, Sally, getting back to the Manchester City that we have seen for the vast majority of the season? Yeah, I, th- I think Sterling starts, absolutely. I think Aguero will start. I think he'll, he'll be gambled on him because, you know, City's season rests on that, that game on Tuesday, so why why keep him back for the league games when they get the league's over? So I think Aguero's back as well. Look, if they score an early goal, it's doable, isn't it? it, it it's, it's, it's three goals. I think they put five past City, Liverpool, albeit with ten men in in September but I do think that Liverpool will go there and score and if Liverpool score then City have to score five and I don't see them doing that so they're going to they're gonna have to score early and just hope they can keep a clean sheet but I don't know I think, I think they've lost it last night Mark listen I really appreciate you taking the time thank you very much cheers guys a couple of things on that go on. so like Liverpool seem to be Manchester City's kryptonite in that <laughs> but when you look at the way the two teams are set up like they're perfectly matched from a Liverpool point of view. City are always going to push up on them. They're going to give them space. It's just not in their DNA to sit back and defend. They're going to try and play it out of the back. Everything about the way City plays mm. suits Jurgen Klopp and the way he wants his team to play. And also, I think in one of your first shows, we spoke about whether Liverpool could win the Champions League. Like, last night was the basis of saying, yeah, they can go very far. Because Real Madrid are going to play like that. Yeah. Bayern, Bayern Munich, Munich are going to play like that. And Barcelona may be are better defensively so and they've shown this season they don't concede a lot of goals and obviously they have the talent at the other end but also they're not going to sit right back mm. so actually at home against anybody in the Champions League you would fancy Liverpool to go and beat them right. which is quite an achievement for Jurgen Klopp like Liverpool Liverpool fans moaning after they lose down in Swansea should be down on their hands and knees thanking God that Jurgen Klopp is their manager they may never have as good a manager again as Jurgen Klopp well, the way he seems to have it over Pep Guardiola because that's six times he's defeated him in mm. 13 games. So in terms of the setup, I agree. And it was interesting, Mark's piece on the ESPN website was very intriguing and he was very damning of Pep Guardiola in terms of his record in Europe uh, and his approach in terms of 
doesn't sacrifice any or compromise on anything he wants to do, regardless of the opposition. That would have been one of the complaints I would have had about Arsene Wenger in the last five years plus, probably, in terms of it. He's not bothered about the opposition. Now, I don't think Pep Guardiola is not bothered about the opposition. He would be fully aware of the strengths and trying to manipulate, I think, Gundogan playing in that central... Well, that's where I'm kind of confused in a lot of the analysis, that he's getting criticised for not changing his style. The problem last night was he did change his style. Yeah, well, that, that's what I'm getting. I think Mark was very damning in it, but I think he did change it last night mm. in terms of that. But I don't think he should have in terms of that. I really don't. And I think playing Laporte was a bigger call mm. at left back. You, you spend 25, 30 million quid on Danilo. Uh, we know Mendy's been a loss this season. We've seen Delft sitting in Zin Zinchenko. That was always going to be an issue. In terms of the team set up, they just could not deal with Liverpool in the first half. Such was the ferocity. They were on a different level than anything I've seen, even in that game mm. in January. I really do believe that they were that impressive. How clinical they were, how energetic, how aggressive. Could not let them settle. But I do think he tweaked it last night. I really do. But it didn't work. He's seen it afterwards. Gundogan Sterling, did it work? No, we lost 3-0. There's a lot of great articles out there today about the atmosphere and the impact it made. Jonathan Liu wrote a brilliant one as well about uh, how it affected Liverpool. And you think back to the 4-3 and Andy Robertson's run up, chasing down the city defence, and he's getting like a standing ovation. And that at the like that feels like a a big moment in Andy Robertson's career. That suddenly he has the love of the Anfield crowd, and he's just gone from strength to strength to strength. And Anfield can be a, if, it, if they're against you, as Simon Mignolet has found out, it can be a different, oh, difficult ground. But it feels now as if almost everybody, maybe with the exception of Dayan Lovren in that 11, has this bond mm. with the crowd and a level of trust that they can bring themselves to another level. You just wonder, like, are Liverpool going to regret these couple of years not getting a little bit closer to the title? Or did Look, it just not have that depth? No, I think the depth is the key. I think you've hit the nail on the head. In terms of Guardiola... Man City, what he's done this year with Man, Man City in terms of the league has been phenomenal. Really has been phenomenal. But one factor in that would be, Mark has touched on it, teams fear them. They, they don't have a goal to them. But a lot of the teams that he's already mentioned, Chelsea's, they haven't got the personnel to really, the physical attributes to do what mm -hmm. Liverpool did. So one-off games, I know this is going to be a double uh, in terms of next week as well. Liverpool can match, they've shown they can match them. But it's the durability over a whole season, the strength and depth. They are getting there. He's doing a magnificent job. Like last night as well, let's not forget, Gomez would have started right back. Trent Alexander-Arnold has been coming under a little bit of scrutiny lately. Inside channel is positioning off the right side of centre-half, no matter who it's been, against United. They obviously got a lot of joy. Wilfred Zaha against Crystal Palace mm. got joy down there. They clearly targeted. Sané played really wide, so they were trying to isolate him. Talk about learning on the job against some top, top talents. We, we all know and we, we all probably agree, going forward and his delivery and the potential, magnificent. But in the space of a few weeks, between himself and the coaching staff, maybe senior players, he's, he's just gone up a notch. Mm. Like a, a few and he's still notches. only 19. Yeah. Like, and he, he's unfortunate. And so all these young players are unfortunate. We're like living in a world now where the criticism is. Yeah. Like, both himself and Joe Gomez could go on and play for Liverpool for the next 10 years, centre-back and right-back. And, and Klopp has done that and he hasn't got them a bl bloody penny. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen as well Conor Masterson yeah. on the bench. Defensive issues, obviously. What do you think was just... going through Conor Masterson's head with half an hour to go? Say if Dejan Lovren just tweaks the hamstring or something, do you want to be going on for the last half hour last yeah, you night? Wanna, you want to be going on, but like you also be thinking... It's the dream for any kid to go on Anfield, Champions League quarter-final, you're 3-0 up, but Manchester City are coming back at you. Yeah, and you make a mistake or... Aguero just slips it off. Nice to sit in the bench and say you were there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But what an achievement for him. I know there's a lot, lot of um, hype around him. But overall, what, do you think it's dead or not, Toy? I think it is. I, 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 I have seen enough of Liverpool to know that they'll always give you a chance. I just think because if City got in the way goal last night, I think it, you'd almost have it 50-50. Mm. But Liverpool are going to score at the Etihad. People go back to the 5-0. That 5 0 was very said, much 50 50 until the red card. You would have said City would, would score last night. You would fancy City to score mm. a goal last night. I would have, and an away goal would have been crucial. Yeah, but I, City need to press forward, so they're going to yeah. have to leave space. Now, again, maybe a lot depends on what happens with Mo Salah and the injury. You'd assume he won't play in the derby. 
it sort of felt and from what Klopp was saying that maybe Salah went oh and it was just no risk oh. we're 3-0 up there's no point yeah. risking it yeah. and he's going to be fine with a break but I think it's mm. is dead so on the bus did you ever get that going to Anfield? Not going to Anfield no it was they weren't odd. out like that though when the no, Wolves when squad were coming through Wolves or West Brom were coming to town it wasn't we as played, ferocious we played today lads yeah sorry <laughs> which, which mediocre Premier League team we <laughs> playing today that we're going to be, beat 3-0 no I've had a couple uh, one was on the bus for Wolves, funny enough, away to Birmingham. We were going on that Christmas party uh, straight from the game. We were going to Gla- I think we were going to Glasgow, so from Birmingham to Glasgow. And the bus got smashed up by the Birmingham fans after the game. We had to After the game? After the game, yeah. It was an early kickoff, it was twelve o'clock kickoff. Um wouldn't have been the biggest rivals would be Wolves West Brom, Birmingham Villa, and then second would be You can still have a bit of a row if needs be. Yeah. It's just Underlying, it's not quite the same right. as a. As, as, uh, and by smashed up, what do you mean? Were you sitting oh, on the bus? We and, sma- yeah, and yeah, where yeah. were you? Just outside the stadium? Just leaving the stadium. As soon as you get on the streets outside the stadium and then bricks against the windows, and yeah, it was. It was and were cool. the windows getting smashed? You know, like. The, whatever shattered? The, yeah, shattered, but not actually glass. Were you worried? Were you. Yeah, a little down. bit worried, like, but I was like, this is, this is crazy. Like, <laughs> fans have gone crazy, then police start arriving. It was. Were your yeah, teammates like, all right? Yeah, there was a few scared, a few on the floor. And, this Who was on the floor? I can't remember. I can't remember. This would have been the team of, say, Paul Ince and Paul Butler. and Was Paul Ince on the floor? No, nah, Paul Ince wasn't on the floor. He'd, he'd probably have it, to be fair. He'd probably have it. But listen, I want to move on um, to a more sombre note. Ray Wilkins um, passed away this week. Uh, he's had a lot of trouble with health in the last few years. I've... Um, been in his company on a few times, maybe f- five, six times. Mm. Gentleman, wouldn't have remembered him playing, but obviously you see clips, and I'm probably you're, you're probably the same, I'd imagine. Yeah, I remember. Was it the goal in the cup final? Was on 101 great goals. Is that Brighton. Brighton, yeah. F four. Yeah, yeah, curling it in. Yeah, and very much seen as because of when he went to AC Milan and went abroad at a time when not it wasn't a done thing. Wasn't was really the done thing. And Italian football was in such a strong place. Yeah, I, it's a shame I don't hugely remember, but he's such a long career as well. Like He played for almost 30 years. He had 20 years almost at the very top of his game and then was sort of omnipresent in our lives for the last couple of decades yeah. from being involved in the game with Chelsea. Coaching. Coaching and also been a brilliant co-commentator. Yeah, I agree. I agree. We'll, we'll, we'll chat about it. I just want to play a little tribute. This is a little video from when Ray was the assistant manager at Millwall in the mid 2000s manager was Dennis Wise going through a tough time and this is a little clip of him just having a chat with some of the Millwall fans no, I just... <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong I respect the fact you've got the bottle to come out here Wait, and talk to you shut up but that's not a problem don't work, come out. I don't even know you fella you don't know me now you just yeah. say well, you don't that. like me where do you get that from? Where do I get that from? Well, get relegation from? last year, mate. Well, I relegation last year. Was I last year relegation? You were part of the club last year. I came in the last two months last year when a fellow had not a penny to spend and we got relegated. Hang on a second. Don't even open your mouth. No, I'm not changed. No subject, fella. I'll answer your questions. But don't start shouting and start, start abusing. Would you not? Would you not? Would you not? Would, would you not say your influence is being stamped on the team with all this sideways backwards 4 5 one pl- I'll tell formation? You what, your influence in your football life has been stamped on a guy that's got a big mouth, Ron Atkinson, that abused probably one of the best centre halves in world football and lost his position in <laughs> ITV, Ron Atkinson. Ron Atkinson so knows fuck all because he said I passed backwards. You I passed played, sideways. Hang on a second. I played eight. We saw that in two seasons ago. One second. We saw that two seasons ago when Wisey was in charge. Sideways oh, football, never attacking. Yeah, and we got to the Millennium Stadium for a couple of And, and then, we, then we were embarrassed at the Millennium Stadium. We didn't, we didn't even perform. Oh, hang on a second. Now, just one second, guys. Just one second. Now, you've asked me, you've asked me to answer a few questions. This young man seems to be taking centre stage. Now, I'm, I'm easy with that. But what he's actually saying is we were going to beat Manchester United. I didn't say we were going to beat them, but we could have put up a fight. 
Yeah, that was the first. Oh, no, no, we had one shot. We had one shot. We didn't go for it. And then why is he blamed Harris for the first goal? My friend. Why is he blamed Harris for the first goal? That's why Harris got going up. Anyway, what's going on now? Well, we're struggling. I have to talk about Hold on, hold on. At the moment. I've heard all the other stars. I talk about what's happening now. I'm easy with that. Now, if you're asking me a simple question like that, we are struggling our backside. Yeah. Sad to he's no longer with us, obviously, and he, he tell you what, take some balls to get yourself in front of Millwall fans. I've played there <laughs> on numerous occasions, had a couple of little run-ins with, with fans, one leaving the stadium, one, I was only about 19, no, what would I be, about 20, 21 at the time, warming up as you do, stretching, fitness coach trying to get you moving, but you were just stretching, just kind of watching the game. A couple of fans chatting away, thinking, oh, these, these fans are all right. Nice fellas, nice fellas. Obviously, news spread. He's Irish. Next of all, I'm getting called Paddy this, Paddy that. So then I get a little bit brave, give them <sighs> a bit back. Next of all, they're trying to get it in at me at the dugout. So um, that was my first experience of. Did they get in? All no, they didn't. The stewards, thankfully, done their job. And then I got Larry again. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but were you, were you, was there a moment of regret? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I was a little bit more melty in those days. Um, but very sad to see such a highly regarded player, part of a coaching setup, uh, and as you said as well, Punda. I, I really, really enjoyed listening to his views on football mm. as a co-commentator. Um, not just a purist, you know, he was also realistic in terms of how to win games and to come through the, the generations of, of footballers and the way the game has changed. Had it to a T for me. Yeah, I think he got what is demanded from a co-commentator to explain why these things are happening. And he also kept himself to the forefront. He kept himself involved all the time in decent jobs. And they treated very badly by Chelsea at the end, uh, where he was rightly held up in such yeah. esteem and they basically just dumped and him Chilali out. left, wasn't that right? Mm. And so popular amongst all the players there. And you've seen that. It's uh, Quite often when, when people die, you see the tributes come through and people feel they have to say something nice. Mm. So many of the tributes, they're not just one line. You can tell they're they're stories very genuine, of, like the story from Nigel Quasi from when he was making his debut and how he had arranged for his mother to come up and arrange for a mobile phone so that he didn't even know that she was coming, willing to go that extra yard for anybody. He's, he was an absolute gentleman. Like I said, I've been in his company and I, a couple of times. One of my good friends was, was captain of that Millwall team, Kevin Muscat. Um, and I would have been in and around the like, hotel when he visited nearby mm. or whatever. And, uh, been in his company with Ray Lewington is one of his best mates, Dean Lewington's dad. He's a coach and coach at Crystal Palace with Roy Hodge and they're big, big mates, so he'll be he'll be suffering. So been lucky to spend very little time with him, but any time I did. And you know as well when you, you were saying about the tributes, they are very genuine. You know, if you see him around, I've seen him in Sky once. Mm. Well if you, you see know, him in the press room, like he again, he, he had time for everybody. Man, yeah. And then when he leaves Everyone, lovely fella he is. If that's the first time people have come across him, lovely fella, oh, mm. what, what a gentleman. Oh, absolute diamond. Just love the voice as well. Yeah, yeah, he'll be, um, he'll be a sad miss. Um, but listen, we're going to move on. We're going to chat uh, Ronaldo Real Madrid in a little minute. But joining us via Skype from Sonny Ross Lair, I think he's in. He's in Augusta. He can't be in Augusta. He can't. Can't be. Move the Whoa. camera, pal. You're on. You're on. It's Mr. Hello. Stephen Hunt. I know where you are. Are you in um, a certain uh, restaurant that you uh, own? I am indeed. I am indeed. I'm not going to plug it. I can do its own plugging over time, Mr. Andrews. Did you lose your razor on the boat? Come on over. Because <laughs> <laughs> your little baby face doesn't mean we all have to be the same as you, Keith. So, Stephen, myself and Nathan were chatting here when you're coming on. So, what do you think the first question we were going to ask you was going to be? Tiger Woods, will he win it or not? And how obsessed I am with Tiger. That was probably question two or three. Mm. Question one is, why are we sitting in this studio the day the Masters is starting and not in Augusta as you had promised us? No, no. Second party. I have to say I was fairly convinced we were all going to Augusta. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't work out. Let's put it that way. And here I am in Gosler Strand. With a sore back, can't even play golf. But I'm in a good place and doing a bit of work. Not like some of you sitting there in the studio talking about golf. How bad, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Did you play on Monday in the Ryan McBride game? 
I couldn't get there. I was I was working on Monday. Did you get get yourself up? Yes, we did. We lost a key member of of your off the ball team in the second game, which cost us the tournament. I would say in terms of legs, but uh, we really had a a good time. It was a good obviously for a good cause and taking all the the fun out of it. But we were there for the right reason and yeah. it was a really good day. Just seeing a little picture of here on the screen with um <laughs> with Damien Duff. You you wore number six. You went Roy Keane for the day, did you? Yeah, well, we all walked into the change room. Obviously, Kevin gilban has got a hundred and something caps, and Duffers is obviously world class in his day. And I looked at eleven and thought, nah, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get your place on the left wing. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I just go for the conservative. For where seven looks like, I wanted to be eleven, so I went for six, and uh, it was a centre midfield dynamo. Did you play smash. in the middle? I played in the middle of a. It was a six side. Actually, real good, real good tournament. Real, real fun to play because you know what it's like. Six. Six aside can be good fun, so we just we let ourselves down in the end. We got beaten in the final, but apart from that, it was a really good day. Good stuff. All right, moving on to the Masters, where we aren't obviously. We are sat in Dublin. You're in Rosslare. We are not in Augusta. Just to, to cement that, what are you expecting? That you you expected me to ask you about Tiger Woods. Just put it into context how obsessed you are with Tiger Woods and how excited you are about seeing him, hopefully contending. Yeah, listen, man, I'm I love all sports, but obviously Tiger Woods in golf is a major impact in my life to a certain degree because you watch sport to create memories you watch sport to try and be try and have someone to inspire to and, and how you to behave in a, in a sporting manner and on the, obviously on the golf course he was very competitive he was ruthless and took that from golf right the way across to football when I was playing and, and brought it into that sport and obviously wanted to do the best every time I entered the pitch It's hard to underestimate just how big a deal it is going to be if Tiger can somehow force his way into contention over the weekend. Even the very fact we can say that. Mm. Six months ago, he was at the President's Cup as a vice-captain and was really talking to the media about, actually, I'm having to consider that I may never play again. I'm struggling to get out of bed in the morning. I'm lying on the floor having to ask my daughter to go and get the physio to give my back a rub so I can actually get up. That is the state he was in. To go from there to contending just a couple of weeks ago, to going back into the Masters as second, third favourite, it's already one of the great stories, but it'll be the greatest comeback sport has ever seen if Tiger can win a major again, but if he can win it this week, mm. which really isn't beyond the realms of possibility. He Last two tournaments, he's been tied for the lead. Last time at Arnold Palmer Invitation, he was one off the lead with, with five to play, had a bit of a collapse, which would worry you. The only thing that you kind of have to reimagine is and one of the great things I don't know Stephen if you've been doing it watching back some of the old Masters on the Masters app where you can watch the final round you forget just how dominant he was now maybe he's lost some of that aura around him but if he is there does he go to another level which I don't think we're really considering that actually maybe if he is in contention on the back nine suddenly he goes this feels familiar and he just kicks on and if he does it's going to be the best TV you've seen all year I do think it's as you both know I've only been proper into it in the last eight couple of years I have always watched the Masters but in terms of Masters Hunty this is probably the most exciting one in years isn't it yeah for sure but the calibre of players that have been playing well recently Dustin Johnson Roy McIlroy even Jordan Speed to a certain degree I think he's had a really good chance this week he's come into a bit of form it's just Sergio Garcia who won last year there's loads of different uh, winners if they want it if they turn up on the day but the Tiger turns up and he brings it to the next level and what he brings to that is the crowd as well gets to the next level. Well, these, these boys haven't seen Tiger Woods get to the next level yet. And if he does, then I'm not too sure whether they're going to be ready for it on the back nine come Sunday. I think he'll be there about. I think he'll grind. Even if he's playing bad at the moment, he seems to grind his way around and he's got back in the habit of, of trying to get up there again. Who would you rather win, Rory or Tiger? Ooh. Ooh. Tiger. Oh, my question. God. It's not even in question. I'm yeah, I'd go, I'd, I'd go Tiger as well. Because I think Rory, he, he's still in his 20s. He has another 10, 15 years where he can complete the career Grand Slam. Whereas Tiger, there's not going to be too many more opportunities. And it will be. It'll just be the story and to be around it and have such an interest in golf and to cover golf. Like it brings it to a whole other level, thinking about going to the Open this year or going to the Ryder Cup. He changes everything. He changes everything in terms of the interest levels around golf. Give me, um, Stephen, give me a, an outsider that you fancy, 25 to 1 plus. Oh, John Rahm, I think, obviously, he's about 14 to 1. I think he'll have a chance. Uh, big outsider, difficult to tell. 
uh, Deschamps as well, maybe. I like Fleetwood. I like Fleetwood, but the only problem for Fleetwood is he's playing with Tiger, mm. which can have a pretty big impact. You even look at Tiger's last couple of tournaments, the players who played with him, their scores were far higher on average because nobody, everybody who plays with him, we spoke to Damien McGray on the show and he played with him once uh, in Dubai. Like, you've never seen anything like it, the interest levels mm. and the disruption and the amount of media around. You, it's very hard to play your normal game. So I'd worry for Fleetwood that rather than inspiring him, that actually maybe a little bit of frustration kicks in. Mm. Stephen, before we let you go, uh, I presume you watched the game last night, did you, Liverpool-Man City? Yeah, I did indeed. Uh, Liverpool were on, on a different level in the first half in terms of on the front foot. And I think Man City obviously coming in on the bus it obviously affected him a little bit in terms of... Do you think it did? Have you ever experienced that on a bus? I, I had a little one, but it was after a game. Have you ever experienced that on the way to a game? And do you think it, it did have a little bit of a part to play in Man City's performance? Yeah, considering the bus couldn't be driven afterwards, obviously it must have been fairly bad. And to get to the level they were at, then they hit him hard. I think maybe some of them. They shouldn't do, if I'm honest with you. But uh, the way they started the game wasn't like Man City at all, and the, the Liverpool atmosphere maybe played a part as well. And they certainly had, they are right on the front foot now. I still think Man City got a chance, believe it or not. And I don't know where Sergio Aguero is and fitness wise, but if he gets fit, then they got a good chance mm. to come back into it. Well, listen, we'll let you go, get back to your um, your lobster lunch down there in Rosslare, OK? But you will be joining us next week. You'll be taking Nathan's place next week in the hot seat. We talked about a Tiger win. Hopefully, for your sake. <laughs> Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Enjoy the sunshine. Have a good day. Bye-bye. He still thinks it's opened. Man City. It's going yeah. to be tough. But like, realistically, like next weekend, sorry to... It could be 2-0 at half, half time next weekend, next week, Tuesday, couldn't it? It could easily. Say, you wouldn't be like, that it's not good. ridiculous. To and say then that. again, we'll go completely the other way and question Liverpool's character and why Jurgen Klopp can't build a defence. And we'll go Pep Guardiola as a genius at the way he can set up an attacking side. Interesting on just on Raheem Sterling and him, him not starting. And Mark Ogden touched on it. He has a terrible record at Anfield. Anfield. Like I'm a huge fan of Sterling. And he gets way too much stick from especially this season from the British media about his personal life and all of that. But. It is interesting that he didn't start him at Anfield. And when he did come on, he mm, was quite very telling. lucky not to be sent off mm. for the kick out at Jordan Henderson first, then a really stupid foul after that. He just can't seem to compose himself in that sort of atmosphere. Well, it's daunting, isn't it? He's still mm. a relatively well, that's young man. <laughs> mm. All right, I want to move on to Ronaldo. Juve against Real Madrid. I did fancy Real Madrid over the two legs. Certainly didn't fancy them to win 3-0 in Turin. And... Well, well they won 4 1 in the final last year yeah. against a far better Juventus team. But going to going to Turin, the way that they play, I know, I know what you're saying. Look, we have to start there. We see the image on the screen of, of that goal. It's it's up there in terms of the greatest ever Champions League goals. Oh. It was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. It's strange how people People try and pick holes in that goal and somehow find something. Well, well, just just in, in terms of context and where, where it ranks, like it's as good as look at the height he gets. To. Oh, phenomenal. There was a bit of a debate in the office this morning About in terms whether of, he wanted to place it. Yeah. Now I I don't think he knows he's putting it right into that corner, but I don't think that matters because you've said about the height he gets to it, the athletic ability, the audacity, the confidence he has to go for that, knowing that it's not an issue. You deserve that little bit of luck that it goes that side and not just See, straight. I disagree. I think you think he means it. I think he means it. No, I, I, I think he probably isn't one hundred percent sure it's going to go there, but I think that's where ideally he's aiming for. And I think with Ronaldo, he has the ability to do these things. If Generally, you, if he if you asked him, do you think he? Well, if you asked him, I think he would say he definitely yeah, meant it. So do I, but that's why I don't particularly like him as a person. What's but, your problem with him? His his confidence I that has made him one of the greatest players of all time. He's just a bit. I don't know, we've just seen a little... Let me, let me get to that in a sec. Agent Barry, let me just read this tweet out. A rouse erupted and off the ball towers. I say Ronaldo meant to put the ball roughly where he put it. Kevin Kilban says he didn't. Opinions welcome. Well, I am with Kevin Kilban. You're with Adrian Barry. Well, see, I think myself and Adrian, we can appreciate true greatness. Whereas yourself and Kevin, because you played to a high level, but you couldn't do that. You can't believe that nobody else could do it. But we still got to a far greater level than yourself and Adrian. No, I'm a, I, I acknowledge that there. Yeah. That was a. I did give you that compliment. But <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, it wasn't really because a it was because you were you were in that say one percent less than point one percent that got to the very highest level. Yet still, you could even dream of doing that. 
No chance. I agree in terms of that. So therefore, you can't recognise that. You don't want to recognise that somebody else oh, I'm saying, could like, do that. Like, go back to me talking about Ronaldo. I do not like him, but I have the Why? What is wrong respect. with him? I think he's a whopper. I think the way he conducts himself off the pitch, he's... What, he's takes a few to, photos of himself on Instagram? A few photographs. He's getting on to Michael Jackson level. Ridiculous. He, he just wants to open Disneyland in his back garden. It's just oh, it's ridiculous. But... In terms of him as a player, so much respect for what he's done in his career. That goal, I don't think he meant to put it in the corner. No, not not meant. Ideally, it's going in the corner. One of the. I don't think he knows that that ball is going into that corner. I think it's very very hard to say that. I really do. You're the type of person that feels Ronaldinho didn't try and put the ball over David Seaman for the free kick. <laughs> that he didn't spot the little gap. <laughs> A killjoy. Uh, let's have a little look. Most goals by a club in the Champions League. Real Madrid, 248. Tenth in the all-time scoring list. Um, huh. Ronaldo's stats are literally on a different level. John Giles talks brilliantly about that he's never seen. So Giles, like everyone, I think, would have Messi and has a lot more love for Messi than Ronaldo. But he's never seen a player like Ronaldo who's happy to do nothing for so long but just wait for his moment. That most players... They want to get involved in the game as much that's as possible. Probably, that's probably more so in the last few years. Mm. I actually think, because at times he's still playing from the left, he needs to be, because there's a bit of a talk at the moment about Lewandowski going to Real Madrid in the summer. Why? Yeah, why just play him as your number nine? He's a far superior right. number nine than Karim Benzema, who right. I do like, but right. he has the two to of play. them in the team together. Mm. Set, exactly. Don't need him. Set him up as the number nine and do whatever you want behind that to get the right system in place to get the best out of Ronaldo. Play him the width of the six-yard box plus five yards either way because he is devastating. Still, over 10 yards, phenomenal pace, sharpness, brightness. We obviously see the, the different types of finishes. Don't have him out wide. Why have him out wide anymore? He can play another f four or five years. We've seen Zlatan the other day in the MLS having an impact, and I know it's the MLS, but in terms of that level... He's a machine, isn't he, physically? He can still go on for numerous years. Yeah, well, also, you kind of feel he's going to get the same amount of touches out left as he is playing in the centre, but he's not going to make as much of an impact exactly. out there. Yeah, have to. OK, we want to move on to Europa League action. Arsenal tonight playing CSK in Moscow. Big tie for them in terms of their season. Um, CSK and Moscow are terrible. Yeah, they really are. They're probably the worst team in the last eight. Best draw they could have had by an absolute mile. Atletico still left in it, playing Sporting. Lazio against Salzburg and Leipzig against Marseille. Um, if they avoid Atletico in the semis, providing they get through, which if they don't, he should be sacked on the spot because they are, I'm with you, they are the worst team left in that tournament. So, But it's, it's a crucial tournament for him, isn't it, in terms of will he be there? If he wins it, does he stay? <laughs> it, it feels again, story, we've gone through the outrage and we're back into the cycle of actually he is going to be there next season no matter what <laughs> happens. Unless, like best case scenario is obviously they win it. Next best is they lose heroically to Atletico Madrid in the final. But probably everybody else means the outrage is back pretty quickly if they lose to any other side. And quickly looking at the weekend, uh, Merseyside Derby and Manchester Derby, you are going to both... I'm very jealous. It's got to be done. Live commentary of Everton Liverpool half twelve on Saturday. Very jealous. I and will then be we're at going West to hot Brom. Hot up to Man City, Man United. You're going to what? I am going to West Brom to watch Alan Pardewless. West Brom West against Brom. who? Against Swansea. Whoo! Classic. See, I think if you had your list of preferred Premier League games to go to all season, Man City, Man United title decider would be number one. Where would West Brom Swansea would literally be bottom of the list? <laughs> uh, there may not be a worse game all season. Who's mad at Sometimes, when you go to these type of games, though, you set your bar that low, your expe expectation level. Shackles are off, and suddenly it's just like, three. let's go. Let's okay. see what we get. But anyway, I would rather have you. Enjoy that. Hands. Yeah, you too. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Really appreciate it. That's all we've got time for this week. Next week, we will have Stephen Hunt in the hot seat, Champions League again next week, and whatever talking points pop up. Thanks. Take it easy.